Okay, great. Um, thank you for joining us in the virtual. We also have a contingent of people in the physical. My name is Likumbi Kapia. I'm the manager for, oh gosh, the name changes for my sector every day. <laughs> current, okay, current landscape livelihoods or artisanal natural products at Prospero Zambia. Prospero is a business support organization. We support and facilitate Zambian SMEs in key sectors to access markets, scale, and create jobs. Uh, today's session is particularly unique, not only because it's virtual, but because it's for a sector that's often not even defined as a sector. You don't even think of yourselves as we are a sector. You don't see yourself in the national development plans, but we do feel that in your own individual contributing economic growth in Zambia and not just economic growth. I think the unique thing about people in this space is you also have an environmental climate friendly or conservation impact some way involved in your business. Um, so before I go any further, I introduce myself. I know we had one person in the virtual introduce themselves. Uh, I'll ask the people in the virtual to type in the chat if it's possible introduce yourselves and we'll just go around the room um, in the physical for people to give us your name, the name of your business and what is your what products you deal in. So I'll start at the back. The one gentleman there. Yes. Sorry, just uh, some housekeeping to allow us to interact with the people in the virtual space, you would have to use the microphone so they can hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Hold on a moment. Okay, just a moment. Okay. Uh, my name is Julius Loya, and I'm um, the founder and uh, CEO of uh, Pesa Foods. So we are in the retail business. We specialize in uh, uh, selling of uh, forest-based uh, foods. So we have, uh, you, uh, so we're among a few uh, stores that actually trade in legal gale meat and then also other forest foods such as mushrooms, uh, caterpillars, honey, and uh, wild fruits. So we are basically a retail uh, store and uh, we specialize in uh, forest-based uh, foods. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Nawa uh, from Licho Foods. So main specialty is making Mauyu or Baobab candy. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Yamidem Kandawire. I'm from Sunny Foundation here representing uh, Makambe Namluanda. She's not here. Um, so at Sunny Foundation, we work with young adults with intellectual disabilities. And then we have, uh, we run um, the Dice Juice Bar meaning uh, disability inclusive and customized um, employment for young adults with intellectual disabilities. So we make a uh, fresh juice from uh, locally grown um, fruits. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Miriam Nalomba Chipuru. I'm the founder and CEO for the company called Shai's Foods. It's an agro processing company, and our main uh, raw materials are the millets, the sorghums, and the cassava. We, we have what we call healthier meals, where we, 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 we process the millet, and then we have what we call healthier porridges. We use the same millets to, to blend and uh, make complementary porridges and for the whole family. We also have what we call healthier flowers where we process uh, flour, just like wheat flour from the millets and sorghum. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Sodez Yambo, um, co-owner of Savanica Foods Limited. So we're into the uh, making of crisps from cassava, plantain, and sweet potato. So, um, yeah, that's that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, my name is Rosalina Mwanza. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of, of Baobab Swells. Uh, Baobab Swells is a business that deals with natural uh, products, uh, natural skincare products. Uh, we specialize in uh, uh, artisan soaps, uh, especially made from goat milk. And then also uh, we've got uh, body creams, uh, lotions, lip balms, all made from natural uh, ingredients and oils. Hello everyone, my name is Karen Kalamba, founder and CEO of Ulusu. We create natural skincare products and um, some products are black soap, liquid black soap, um, black soap itself, food scrubs, um, all these products are made from natural ingredients. Good morning everyone, my name is Angelica Chulandopiri. CEO and founder of Angelica Natural Skincare. Uh, we make our, our products from the fruits of our natural forests. We uh, extract our own oils and our main line is anti-aging. Thank you. Morning everyone. My name is uh, Violet Folika. I'm from Angelica. I'm, I'm assisting Mrs. Piri here. Great. So I'm just going to read the ones that were in the that are in the group. We have Barry from Kuwaha Naturals. He manufactures natural soaps. We have Moira. Uh, you're still branding your products, ginger products, I believe ginger organic products. Moira, if you could type the name or you're still having a name, okay. Still thinking of the name of your brand. I was going to ask for the brand or the name of your company. We have Chaiwe Mushuka Sandish, CEO of CabDev Capacity Development and they offer agriculture and ad free business training to communities and SMEs, branding, marketing, financial market access and proposal writing. So there are business support organizations similar to Prospero. I've missed anyone. Kindly put your comments in there. Just so everybody is aware, this meeting is being not only, hi Mitt from Luana Honey, hope we can, hope you'll be coming in. Um, this meeting is not only physical and virtual, but it's also being recorded. So we'll share the recording with you in case you're missing some particular aspects. Um, thank you. Right. Why is this not here? So I just wanted to provide, now that we've done an introduction, a bit of a background of why we're having this um, session. I'd mentioned, of course, that it's because Prospero saw an opportunity um, that of working in this space and um, that this was a somewhat uh, disjointed sector. You're all doing great things by yourselves but maybe not aware of who was in that space. Um, I was sharing a bit about uh, how this work came about. So at Prospero, we work in particular sectors that are seen as uh, high economic drivers uh, in Zambia. And one of those spaces in tourism is tourism. And as we all know, Zambia's main attraction for tourism is our natural assets, the environment. Uh, but there's also communities and people around those spaces that need, if we're thinking about job creation livelihoods. So when we looked at what are those communities doing in and around their spaces, we saw most of them were harvesting the masuku, baobab, putting it on trucks and sending it to town. Some of them doing basket weaving. Some decides to go into poaching or cutting down trees because that's more lucrative. And we said, well, is there an opportunity for SMEs around here? And if there is for value addition, who's already doing it? So we did an assessment um, in two landscapes, Southern and, and Western province, to find out what was there, what natural ingredients grow there, and then who was doing what. And what we found was that there were a lot, many businesses already trading in this space, producing mawuyu juice or drink and selling it to Melissa, uh, making drinks, soaps, but each on their own. So for example, somebody like Madame Rosalind doing soaps needs mongongo oil, but she doesn't know that somebody like Madam Angelica or Kalahari is actually uh, 
processing the soaps in Zambia. So there's a bit of a disconnect. And we felt that we could, as Prospera, we could come in and help add value to the sector. So we had a, a webinar, and I think some of you attended last year. Oh, goodness, I don't remember, Madam. When was it? After we did the assessment this year, it was this year, earlier this year. February. Oh, so there are some people I've known here for some time because we found them. And the webinar was just to share some results of the assessment, that there are gaps and opportunities, and also to hear more from the individual businesses. So what, what are you doing? Where do you find challenges? So we asked them, for example, one question, 24 people answered this, but of course we have more, I think at this point in our little group. Uh, where, do you, where do you work? Most people were in the food products, dried fruit, dried, dried mushrooms, um, caterpillars, any type of edible food from, the, from forest products or healthy foods. I think there's an, by the way, there's an overlap. So while we typically, for this sector, we don't, we, uh, we try to focus on forest products, there's an overlap with health products and we understand and recognize that and don't want to necessarily separate too much from that. Uh, then there's health supplements. Think of all the times where you, you go to a market, they say, this powder is good for BP. What's the name? There's no English name. <laughs> so that falls under that one. There's beverages. I already mentioned the Manguyu group and there's others. People, there's a whole list of others that fall under that. But most people were doing edible. Uh, we also found that we, when we asked them, because these, many of them are local. Yes, we do know that sometimes to make, for value addition, you have to add something to your product but most people were sourcing locally. So when we asked them, where are you sourcing? Southern province, of course, came number one, uh, but there's also Lusaka province. And I think that has an overlap of people finding things in Lusaka because people brought them from outside, but it could also be because our packaging, our other materials, uh, even the imported inputs come, are found in Lusaka. Uh, where do you sell your products? Most people were selling via social media. They'd find their customers there. Somebody would send them a DM and the message there. Then there's also the growing of food markets in Osaka. Many people were going to those food markets. Very few, and I'm happy that Mr. Julius is here, had a retail shop, which means their own, there was two, phase, two ways to do it. Either somebody else's retail shop, for example, Moyo, or having your own branded retail shop. Uh, so Julius is a retail or Peza Foods is a platform for other natural producers to sell their items to their own. Umoyo is a platform for other producers to sell their products to them. And then there are others. You can be selling at the corner to friends and family in your WhatsApp groups. There's many different places. But what was interesting to see, and this may be because of the pandemic, is that digital sales or sales converted from a digital platform was the highest for people. Now, when we ask them, okay, so what, what are the problems that you're facing? Number one, I think over almost over 90% of people said logistics or distance to sourcing my inputs. The second issue that most people face was market access. Where am I going to sell the, these things? Uh, yes, we have identified those places, but identifying those places and conversion to sales is, is there's a difference in, in that aspect. Another big one, and this is for the other one, many of you is packaging, whether it's food or cosmetics, is where you're sourcing your packaging. And the majority of people, it's outside of Zambia uh, or having somebody provide them outside of Zambia. Then there's, of course, input supply where you're getting these things. And a big one, especially for, I mean, I think this is for many people, is equipment. How do you get the oil out of the nut? How do you make big batches of your cosmetics cream? How do you dry the plantain chips at a large scale, at a large scale to increase your production and increase your sales. So understanding this, we thought of convening a space, first a space for all the, the SMEs working in this sector to sort of facilitate learning and engagement. Myself as a business support or Prospera as a business support entity and myself working in this space, I have, I've had conversations one-on-one -on -one with several of you, and I can see similar uh, issues cropping up or similar opportunities, but we wanted a space where you could engage with each other and have some shared learning and uh, shared 
solution finding. Um, so that's the sharing challenges and lessons, but also to identify individual and sector-wide opportunities for growth. And the way I like to express this is there currently we believe the size of the pie is maybe, you know, it's so big, it's small, and everybody's fighting for a bigger slice. But our approach is for is saying, can we increase the size of the entire pie so that your share is bigger without you, without getting into this competitive space? So if we, if we can increase your market size or market awareness, because sometimes people didn't even know you as your, as your product, instead of buying Dove soap, I now buy Baobab swirls. Instead of eating Lay's chips, I now eat plantain chips because they're going to look so sometimes it's also market awareness, but also access to an opening to new markets. Many uh, of the businesses that we have engaged with in the last few months as we've got to know the sector really either sell in Osaka, if they're lucky, along the line of rail. And in a few of them that have gotten very uh, adventurous, I say, I'm going to take my things to Kasumbalesa, which has got its pros and cons. Uh, I don't want to necessarily rush and say export market, uh, though there is a huge opportunity and later today we'll be hearing about that opportunity as well. Um, so I'm going to give you a chance to contribute. Uh, but I think at this point, I've, I've, I've mentioned what, why we put this together as Prospero, but I think you all have taken the time to be here today. Those online taking the time here to log in today. I'd like to hear what your expectations of this engagement is, are, and um, I'll see whether we are hitting some of those points. So I'm going to ask one or two people who are brave <laughs> in the physical to say, what, do you, what are your expectations from today? And also in, in the chat, um, just a quick point. Are we able to have the people in the virtual speak or not yet? Yes? Okay. And in the virtual, you can also, and I'll we'll do this in this, actually maybe let's start with you. You can unmute yourselves in the virtual and let me know, let us know what your expectations of today's engagement are. If I can, I'll pick on somebody. Uh, I'm happy to go. Please go ahead. If, I could, if uh, you can hear me, yes. This is uh, Chaiwe, Mshao um, Kosanerse. For me, the organize, my organization is slightly different from the participants that are uh, present this morning, physically and both virtually. So I'm uh, basically not a pro producer of any local products but I have a huge interest uh, in uh, growing the capacity of producers on the market, but also offering services with respect to um, agribusiness uh, development, similar to what you, you mentioned, some of what Prosper is looking at. But I also see a lot of relations with Pesa Foods who are offering a platform for sale. So uh, currently we are doing our research to find out who's on the market and then offer them a space uh, for sale uh, in a central location. And my expectation is uh, basically to get to know where everybody is. I think uh, one of the things that we do not have access to uh, in terms of service provision from a capacity point of view is where are the producers. Um, it's interesting to find that, uh, you know, the survey only covered 24 producers, but I'm pretty sure there's more and um, I hope by the end of this uh, workshop, we have some direction on how we can find the rest. I'm quite sure there are hundreds and thousands of producers out there dotted around uh, the country. So what sort of strategies are we going to employ? How can my organization who is more targeting to proving the skills of these producers, how can I contribute to ensure that we get to these producers and we have the numbers? And then and only then can we really create a competitive market and a more uh, informed, more uh, robust market that offers products of different types to the local community, but also to the uh, foreign co community. So for me, it's really about the numbers. The numbers really also offers uh, value in terms of produ production, in terms of relevance. Thank you very much. 
thank you for that contribution about uh, getting the numbers and thinking about strategies around that. That's that's uh, quite critical. Is there any one more, one or two more people in the virtual would like to comment on the expectations? Yes, yes, this is Anne um, with uh, cassava byproducts. I have my prototypes and um, truth be told is, you know, I really don't know what to do with them now, um, where to get market. I'm dealing with crisps and um, hand sanitizer uh, made out of ethno. As you know, ethno is a cassava byproduct. So I'm very excited that, you know, you're going to do all those things for us, God willing. So those are my expectations. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. I actually have come across uh, your business that does the ethanol, the hand sanitizer from cassava. So thank you for joining. Um, maybe I, I'll just read out Moira's comment here, if it's okay, Moira. Uh, she said a big area of lack for her is still learning about, oh dear. I do that. <laughs> They're still learning about how to preserve her products without adding preservatives and sourcing to still get an essential oil from ginger. Did I stop sharing? Okay, good. Now maybe I'll go around the room for the Uh, yeah, I think for me, it would be linkages in terms of distribution, retail. So it's good that I think Julius is here. So I think we'll probably have that discussion. But also more importantly, I think the process on my part, a lot of it is manual. Uh, so it would be good to know like where the machinery at this point is not even about for me, the money, but getting to know what the machine is that can make my work easier. Yeah, like what's the name of it? Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Is there maybe one or two more with expectation? Please go ahead, Madam Angelica. Uh, my expectation is the if I could network, you know, find somebody. With my other uh, SMEs who are in the same, like we are all doing processing. I, you know, there's like uh, in seed processing, nut cracking is a nightmare. We need machinery that because a lot of, when we do it manually, half of the, half of the, we lose half of the products. So is there anyone who has access to market or to someone who can design the, you know, design the nut crackers, not the nut, not the, crackers of walnuts, but crackers of hard, hard uh, uh, seeds, like marula, mungongo, you know, it's really a nightmare. So I would really love somebody to connect me to somebody. Thank you. Go ahead, Julius. Uh, you know, for me, because since we are still uh, a new store, it's more to do with uh, visibility because uh, we are in our um, third month of operating uh, our store. And um, in the process, I've come to learn like what uh, product uh, move, uh, like I bought uh, more often. Uh, for example, one of my shocks was that people like uh, caterpillars a lot. Uh, like they buy them almost every day. Uh, so for me, it's more to do with uh, visibility. And then also knowing who the, uh, like the genuine and uh, organized suppliers are. Because some, sometimes you'll find uh, people with uh, stock, but then they do not have proper information. They have vague ideas of what they are selling is. Uh, like yesterday I posted the leaves in the group um which so like when i went to to buy uh, at soweto they just if mama sevenza wa sugar wa bp they were never cool my if so like um uh, what's the name ah tima vitana chabati masamba 
so but then these are leaves but then she would know these they like them a lot like because i'll tell uh, uh, my stories are uh, at him now around about ah kujan kumaya di baza gola baza gola but then like because me i want to go a step further in getting those things and then package them brand them under pesa foods so that uh it's more organized more neat someone who is decent uh, or who who can't go to soweto or who can't go to the rural areas to get these things they will still find them in our store and buy them because they are labeled and then uh, ourselves being uh, a business we somehow are organized and someone has confidence in uh, purchasing our our product so those are some of the things for me which i expect more to do with the visibility both for ourselves and also the people whom we may be getting stock from thanks julius but before i comment on on that and the markets and something you really touched on on sharing in digital knowledge i've noticed a young lady has come in and i'll just ask you to introduce yourself your name your business or the business that you want to start and the main product that you're in Hello, my name is Kasweka Konga. Um, the business that I do is uh, dry fruit and nuts, in particular cashew nuts, but I'm hoping to expand that to incorporate um, even just different types of nuts. Um, I process that into flavored nuts, uh, as well as uh, cashew butter and flour, as well as I'm trying to try trying to do milk, um, which is not, I guess, very indigenous because I'm not too sure if cashew nuts are indigenous to Zambia per se. Um, but then I'm also trying to do dried fruits, in particular mango and um, avocado chips. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kasweka. I, I just want to touch on two points. As I mentioned before, we're not making too much of a distinction between considered healthy fruits and wild fruits or natural products. I think there is enough overlap. Uh, and then the second point is, Julius had mentioned something uh, about asking in the group. So if you're not sure what group Julius is talking about, we have a WhatsApp group with about, I believe we're almost over 40, 46, some members. So even more than who answered the survey that I shared before. If you'd like to join those group, this is a lot of, we also, we share a lot within the group. People ask questions like Julius asked last night, what are the name of these leaves? Or where can I get this? Or we sometimes share stories that we think the other people are, might be interested in. We try to keep this group as focused on the topic as possible. So we don't have good morning, good morning, good morning <laughs> in, the, in the group. We try to keep it quite focused, but it's also another way for you to connect with other people. And I think one of the best things about the group at, so, uh, so far, which is also why we're having this virtual is that not all the people are Lusaka based, some are in Livingston, Southern Province, Western, but they can still engage with the topic because oftentimes we, we have this Lusaka people mentality that all the business is happening here, but actually you may need connections in South and Western because that's where the inputs or whatever comes from. Uh, I'll share one more thing that's in the comments. There is, ooh, there's a lot in the comments. Zest is Zambia encouraging sustainable trade, is based in Mukushi and have a database of various producers as well as shot a shop which may be good platform for many of you and they can post if you're interested please share the link or facebook because what i'll do is a lot of the links and contacts that are popping up in the chat first of all i mentioned it's recorded but i'll share those with everybody who's actually attended the meeting so that you have that information all right so i really wanted to make sure we went through the expectations so that i'm not wasting <laughs> your time but this is what we're going to cover today okay why are we not moving? Okay. So we have done registration for the physical and the virtual. Our introductions, um, of course, and I've given a bit of a context to this workshop. I'm going to talk about the bigger picture about our sector. And we had a conversation in the group about whether we call ourselves non-timber forest products. Is it biotrade? Is it wild fruits? Is it indigenous fruits? But I'm going to talk about the bigger sector, the big picture. If we looked at it globally or regionally, what does it look like? Then we come down to Zambia. Um, we'll have a discussion about that. I'll share with you uh, Prospero's consortium approach to growing this sector. It's really just an idea. You are the actors. 
And the reason for sharing is, is to validate, to get your validation. Do you think this approach to growing the sector, increasing the pie could work? Who's missing? Who needs to be there? Uh, and I'm happy that there's a capacity support building organization already participating in this engagement today. Uh, what we promised, and I think what also came up in the group and has come up here is, I want to map who else is in my, in, in this sector, or I'll use the development terms, I'm sorry, value chain. I'm a cosmetic producer. Who are my suppliers downstream? People doing the, the maybe Baobab, Mongongo, even the people where you get your goat milk from, <laughs> as in Rosalind. Who are they? Where are they found? You may find other people have overlaps. Definitely overlaps in packaging or logistics. So we do want to see where's the value chain? Where do you spend your most money or time or where your headaches? And that's sort of maybe where we can develop an action plan around that. We'll take a quick break, also allowing with the virtual to have a quick break. And the, we'll have a presentation after tea break about new opportunities for Africa from, the bio, from what we're calling bio trade. That's the term that's used most commonly internationally for our sector. And I'll explain a bit about it later. And it'll be lessons from the Baobab sector. And we'll actually have a gentleman, I didn't put his name here, but it's uh, on the agenda called Gus Le Breton. He's based in Zimbabwe and he is the president of the Baobab Alliance. It's a continental group that works towards the promotion and advancement of the Baobab sector. But he himself is quite, I mean, Gus, I've spoken to him quite some time, He's quite knowledgeable about indigenous plants. And as you know, even though he's based in Zim and he does a lot of work actually in the Southern Africa and going up to, he was in Kenya the other week, many of our products are transboundary. Mongongo doesn't stop just because there is Zimbabwe. Devil's Claw goes into Namibia. So he's got a lot of knowledge around the products, the landscapes, and also the market opportunity. So he'll be sharing those with us. We'll have an interactive activity for mapping the calendar of inputs. Uh, many of your, so many of you know that some of our inputs, if they're not grown commercial, commercially as seasonal, you can only get masuko at a particular season. You can only get uh, wild tamarind at a particular season, kawawasha, right? So knowing when those seasons are may help also in your input or sourcing inputs. Uh, and I'll share a little bit more about uh, work we've already done on that. Then there'll be the key bit at the end, which is charting the way forward. So what would you as primary actors in this space like to see or happen? Uh, and I leave it up to you. I don't, I don't say that, no, what you must do is this because you're the actors. We are just a business support entity, but we've seen an opportunity to use our tools and our mandates to support you and maybe even link with other support uh, entities or yeah, support entities, whichever they may be to grow this sector. So that's what we're going to cover today. I hope it meets some of your expectations. I've seen some overlap and yeah, we'll pr proceed. Um, I will, so for, just for housekeeping for the virtual, I'll try to see I, if we can look at hand raised, but it'll be very hard for me. Let's see, just a moment. Can you see the hand raised on your side? No, not really. Okay, I'll, what I'll do is try to come back to you whenever we have a discussion session, but please put your comments in the chat and I'll, I'll draw from there as well. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment. Oh, thank you for all the people who have joined. We'll go into the next slide. Okay, not sharing my screen. Oh, I've got a short video to share. I can do the video. Okay, so I'm gonna share a brief video. Our next bit is about the con Actually, before I do this, um, the people in the room, I'm going to make you stand up, sorry. And I'm going to ask maybe the people in the chat, the people in the virtual to put this in the chat. On a scale of one to five in the chat, um, how much do you know about um, global standards on biodiversity and conservation? One is I know nothing. Okay, zero is I know nothing. One is I know a little bit of something. And then five is I know exactly what you're talking about. Now in the room, so in the chat, the people in the groups, how much do you know about? Yeah, <laughs> I have seen people put. So in the room, I'm going to ask you to do something even different. I want you to make a U shape, starting here, going there. This is zero, this is five. So going around this table, if you say I'm a PhD in 
conservation and biodiversity stand over here. <laughs> if you say, I don't even know how to spell conservation, stand over here. Okay, I know you know something, you're a little bit there. So I want to see, I'm just trying to draw local uh, crowdsource knowledge. So I'm gonna check the chat to see who our PhDs are. Moira is, Moira is up there. So we're coming to Moira for some help. Okay. Chalway knows a bit. Anna, Annie says zero, says nothing. All that no, exactly, make a line. All that no, the PhDs in, yeah, make a straight line, the PhDs. So where's zero? Where's zero here? Julius is zero there. Okay, Barry says two, Barry. Because I know you, I think you know a little bit more than two. No, no, no. Can you make a line up this, this across the room? So, see my sister can. Oh, oh, oh. So, so, that's so, that's so, the way you started this thing. So, zero there, zero there, and three, so. three here. What's three? Three is, I know, I, I can tell you a few things. I can tell you maybe some laws and badges that cover biodiversity. And there's a few departments. I think that I know what you need to know for Oh, so that counts. That counts. Oh, okay. So do you need particular things to uh, set licenses or things to work in your space? And do you have them? Do you know that they're there? Number yes. one. Do you have them? Yeah, in the process. In so relation just... of conservation. So I'll give you an example specifically for Julius. Julius deals in legal, legal game use. Okay. For yeah. it to be declared legal game use, there's something that he needs. He knows it and he has it. So he needs to come and stand with me. <laughs> okay, all the way from yeah. zero. You are licensed. <laughs> so we have, we are coming to at least we do that. So some of the they say, I know conservation means this, but in my business's con context, am I applying that? Do I use it in any way? Uh huh, you're coming with closer. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me give some. Okay, and then what about the end? I just know how to spell conservation. I might not even know how to spell it. So let me share. <laughs> Let me share with us. Uh, uh, two or three. <laughs> in between. At least we can. Or you can have one leg here. Yeah. 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 Oh, somebody has a master's, Annie has a master's in conservation. So she's, that's in the virtual. So that's a, cl a clap for you. Well done. We're going to be coming to you for, to validate <laughs> our information. Moira put, she's a, at a four. So she has, she has some knowledge or understanding. So I'm gonna share the, so we're just gonna share what, how the people are standing in the group so that the virtual can also get an appreciation. So at this end with the lovely lady wearing the tan scarf, we had said that this is, I don't, I just maybe not to spell the word conservation, <laughs> right? That's what we discussed, <laughs> that was our proxies. In the middle, they said, maybe I understand a bit about it and maybe how it links to my business, but I might not be actively using those principles. Now, the other end here, we have people who not only know what it is, they know any, they know particular or local standards that apply to, that, about conservation and apply them in their businesses. For some, they even have licenses or fulfill statutory obligations that are related to conservation in their business. Okay, so that's where we are. Let's see, thank you everybody, please have a seat. So Moira says maybe she's a three. I think Moira, it could be more than this. So why did I just ask you that? Um, I should have asked you this question first, but let me ask you, I'm going to ask uh, who's the key person here. I'll pick on people I know. Um, Peter, why did you decide to do baobab sweets and just not make any kind of, why couldn't you just make any kind of sweet? Well, I think partly it's studies uh, I've done around value addition of products. And I always thought 
if I was to get into farming, it would have to be value addition. And having grown up with eating baobab uh, from a young age, so I knew all the fruit very well. Then doing research, knowing that's a super food just motivated me. So everybody was doing, I've, I've seen the juices uh, before. So I thought something different would probably be the sweets. Thank you for that. So I've noted it's one thing, there's a linkage to something you grew up with, uh, something that's found naturally. Uh, when I ask this question, when I meet with businesses one-on-one, -on -one, many talk about, yes, there's this uh, nostalgic bit to it. I used to eat this fruit masuk when I was younger, but then there's also, see, uh, because you're all entrepreneurs, a valid uh, uh, addition opportunity. Many who are sourcing from the communities always say, there's also an aspect of uh, livelihoods for those primary sources. And if you're dealing in the trees, you say, I don't want them to cut down the, the baobab tree, for example. It's got a value and the local community needs to learn the value. So all these principles, even though they seem, uh, I won't say superficial, simple at this point, they're all grounded actually in a global standard called the, called the Convention of Biodiversity. And when that, within that convention of biodiversity, there's a space for how we access natural products and how both the communities where they're sourced, the businesses that they use that, that transform them and even the consumers derive value from them. There's actually a global standard. Uh, of course, with everything global, it's, uh, it's uh, created by the UN uh, and it's sometimes called the Nagoya Protocol. So I'm going to show you a short video and then explain to you why this is important. It links to that video. Okay. Last comment, uh, just for the virtual, please feel free to put any comments about this in the, in the chat.
biological and cultural diversity are under threat, we urgently need to think of ways to conserve them. In 1992, at the Rio Earth Summit, countries negotiated an agreement to conserve biodiversity and promote its sustainable and equitable use. The Convention on Biological Diversity, also known as the CBD. The agreements that came from this meeting, as well as earlier and later agreements addressing conservation, economic development and indigenous people's rights, helped create a new approach that sought to balance economic development, conservation and often indigenous rights. One part of the convention, known as Access and Benefit Sharing, or ABS, was intended to provide both an incentive for governments to conserve biodiversity and enable its sustainable use, and a mechanism to fund the costs of conservation. New medicines, crops and other products developed by industrialized countries could contribute to economic development and conservation in high biodiversity countries. However, it is now 30 years down the line and there is little evidence of conservation. A million species are threatened with extinction and ecosystems are under enormous pressure. This short video looks at the role biodiscovery and biotrade can play in supporting conservation. Let's take a step back and talk about the research and economic activities ABS was based upon. Biodiscovery, also known as bioprospecting and biotrade. There are big differences between biotrade and biodiscovery, and we need to understand these differences in order to think about conservation benefits. The CBD was originally linked to biodiscovery, the collection and research of biological resources in order to discover genetic information or biochemicals of value, primarily in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology sectors, but also including crop protection, food and beverage and others. But biodiscovery rarely leads to blockbuster commercial products and may also be far removed from species and ecosystems and disconnected from conservation on the ground. Biotrade is the use of biodiversity, usually for the cosmetic, food, botanical medicine and other sectors relying on raw materials. Let's run through some differences between biotrade and biodiversity. So I'm just going to stop it there. <laughs> I will share a link to this video I'm echoing a bit. Um, in the post video in the post uh, workshop email. The key thing I wanted to share with you was one, there's global standards to sourcing wild foods. And second is introducing uh, two things, the convention on biodiversity and the term biotrade, which uh, in the beginning when I introduced myself, I said at Prospero, we use the term biotrade to describe what we're doing. So it's the commercial, adding commercial value to wild foods in a way, or wild fruits and natural products in a way that's sustainable, benefits the community and uh, benefits the community and also is um, sustainable or adds or benefits. We actually say all that, all actors in the value chain. Sorry, there's three people in the waiting room. Okay, so we can use the term non-timber forest products, but that, that switch of uh, commercialization is why we call it biotrade. The second bit I wanted to say, actually, maybe I ask you all a question. Um, is Zambia a party to the Convention on Biodiversity? I see heads nodding in here. In the, in the, in the virtual, what do you think? Put yes, no in the chat. If you think Zambia is a... So, the answer is yes, Zambia is party to the Convention of Biodiversity, which means Zambia must uh, actually uh, implement some of those access and benefit in the regulatory, through our laws, the access and benefit sharing. The second is 
we talk a lot, and I'll give to our local contents, context. I know you are all aware that we have this new Ministry of Green Economy, and this means bio trade falls under green economy. Right. We often hear about green bonds and green funding. Part and usually they talk about it in terms of energy or carbon. You hear the funding is for that, but actually, part of it should also be for bio trade. And there was a mention in the CBD that there should be a fund to preserve to preserve or to fund conservation. And one of those things is if your businesses are preserving conservation, shouldn't they have a fund or have access to that fund that uh, preserves conservation? Uh, there are examples on the continent and I wanted to, we had shared this in our WhatsApp group and I think we had an interesting discussion and I, we, it, people thought that we were talking about uh, intellectual property. When we mentioned that the communities where these this, uh, indigenous products come from should have some rights around those things. So imagine something like Mongongo Baobab. Or let me, let's talk about something we all know. So in South Africa, I'm sure you're all aware of rooibos tea or fresh pack as we like to call it, right? Fresh pack or rooibos tea, some people take it because why they feel it's more healthy and it is healthier than black tea. But that comes from a particular re region, transnational region, South Africa and Namibia. And the knowledge about the tea and the plant is indigenous to the San, Khoi San community. And they went through a process, and I'll share the links uh, here of the study that helped that, that this is drawn from or the work that was done around this. They went through a process where the rights to call commercially to call something Roy Boys, they must pay to a fund that goes to the Khoi San community. If you do not pay to that fund, you cannot call it Roy Boys. You may see things like honey bush or red tea, but the name Roy Boys is owned by that community. That's something, that's a concept in the bi Convention of Biodiversity called, uh, gosh, I'm gonna say, uh, bio-geolocating or things like that. If, it's actually quite stronger. You, if you look at the indigenous or first communities in Australia and other places, they also are, they also have such notions. It's similar to if I, my friends who like, for example, nice things, champagne, how only champagne can be called champagne if the grapes are from a certain region of France. That's the same concept that they're sort of following. Um, but this idea of access and benefit sharing is part of the Convention of Biodiversity, is part of how other communities, and I'll go against South Africa because they're our closest neighbor, is developing their biotrade sector. They have actually entire sector development plans for Roibos, Baobab, Marula, of how they're going to develop those sectors. And closely related to that is how you, is it ethically and sustainable sourced? Can you add a margin? It's more expensive. If you, if you say it's unique for these properties and unique from this region, then the value, the marketing value also increases. So there's many uh, interlinking concepts that go with following. Uh, yes, I'll definitely add you to the WhatsApp group, Mr. Stephen. So there's many um, concepts that go into this. Madam Angelica has got a question. I just wanted to add a, a comment on, on that because I was doing a project in Tawe and it involved collecting the fruits from the natural forests. So the Department of Forestry, they, ha they had to tell us that by law, we have to form what they call community groups. And yeah, where you are, where you are going to source these commodities from. And it has to, like you go through the chiefs, you go through, and you, you actually, uh, they have forms that you fill in and you, you go into a contract with the community. Um, we also had to collect mafura from town. We had to go and uh, go into a contract with the uh, city council to, for them to allow us to, to collect mafura from the streets. Actually, the laws still exist. It's there, there, there. Thank you, Madam Angelica, for that. So you see, you knew more than you. You had. So you should have moved to the other end when we said, "Are you a PhD?" But but you're right. The laws do exist in Zambia. We may not know that we're following the convention, but they do exist. And one of the key things is the community resource boards that you find many times in the rural areas. You wonder that why are these groups formed like this? It's because of that. They, and forestry department is key. Uh, they do community forest management. Um, 
they do like you said collection of, of the fruits even the communities themselves probably do need some awareness of why they're being required to form these groups many times we're just saying well, of course you can take care of the trees and don't cut them or you can also do some honey but i think a, a better understanding uh, of why we, we put we we do or we follow those rules i will ask if anybody actually in the in the virtual or in the physical has had experience dealing with either community resource boards or other engagement with government entities around conservation if you want to actually i will put julius on the spot <laughs> Julius, again, because I know your business, if you can talk about how you engage with the government departments around conservation or the types of um, statutory licenses that you needed to get to open your business. Um, so the, the key one, I think, um, for GEOMIT, GEOMIT comes with its own uh, permit. So you need to go to the Department of uh, Wildlife and National Parks, and then they will assess, they will visit you physically, they see that the business does exist. Uh, the application is free. And then when you've been asked, the, the, they've uh, accepted that, yes, you can, uh, they can give you the permit. That's when you then get the license and then you pay based on uh, how long you'd want to, to trade in uh, legal government so you do that and then the other uh payments that you need uh the ordinary one uh, as a business the council uh, sorry when you source your game meat what do you need to see from the other side uh so uh for us we are only uh, allowed to get from uh legal sources so that uh for example i have people uh, who come even to the to the shop, they'll say, uh, I have a gun, I also hunt, uh, can we supply you? And they're like, uh, do you have papers? And then they'll say, no, I said, okay, no matter how cheap your meat is, if there are no papers, I can't buy it because for me, I'm trying to create a brand here and we can't be associated with uh, uh, the, the poachers. So you find that even in the language, it's uh, different. So when you're talking about girl meat, uh, as we say cages, others say bundles. So when you hear bundles, and they just know that you are on the black market. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason, um, there the are challenges. The, the black market is so strong so that it dominates. It's even cultural. Like uh, the majority, for example, if you don't mention that the girl meat is fresh, they won't buy it because to them, girl meat is dry. And um, the, so going back to the papers or the, the, the permits. Uh, so apart from the, the one you get from the department, uh, the other things that you need, I think, as a way of just being part of the ecosystem, uh, we are part of the NGOs that support our work. Like um, this is not a game. They are helping us a lot in terms of uh, visibility, uh, ensure that we feature on radio. So they, they are helping us. Uh, we are looking forward to joining the Wildlife uh, Pro, uh, Wildlife Association uh, producers. Yeah, that, yes. <laughs> so we are looking forward to joining them uh, because they also play a vital role in ensuring that uh, we source meat from uh, legal sources. And uh, in, our, uh, in our journey of uh, sourcing this meat, <laughs> there's a trail of paperwork. So when I buy, let's say from, uh, uh, from Likumbi farm or game ranch. So Likumbi game ranch has to give me uh, a paper, which uh, is a receipt. And then that receipt is what I take to the department. So they can't give me a license if I just go empty handed and they say, oh, uh, this is legal government. I'm, I'm a legal uh, trader. They will not, uh, so because they have to issue the permit based on the paper that I give them. So, yeah. Just to add, I think you had mentioned just your thing. You had mentioned, I think one of the places you you source is like a community game ranch. Is that correct? Yes. So, uh, we we mostly like uh, like this one where we buy. What we buy is what the community can't buy. So uh, the community has to benefit from the resource. Now, uh, looking at the pricing and everything, so the community, for example, can't afford steak fillet. 
So they leave that for the Lusaka market. So as we buy that, and then the community eat, uh, like gets the meat, mixed cut, offers and everything else. That's what they, they buy. So that way the community still gets what they can afford because they buy like at the very, uh, there's a difference of like 60% in terms of pricing. So they buy it cheap, we buy it expensive because ourselves were, were targeting the Lusaka market. Thank you, Julius. And for, again, again, plug his shop. We're very close to it for the physical attendees. It's just across Manali roundabout. So you must definitely, after this, we're only doing half a day, must pop into his shop and see where it is. So you've got no excuse to say, I don't know where this platform is. But what I wanted to get from, and thank you for your contribution, Julius, is that in his supply chain, even though he may not have known it, the access and benefit sharing of the community is embedded. Communities in and around protected areas in Zambia are encouraged to actually create community game ranches to stop them from poaching and to legally sell the game meat into the market. Now, we can debate about how well that concept is being <laughs> picked up, but it's there, right? And maybe one of the reasons it wasn't picked up is because the access to market for a legal, you know, where would I legally go and purchase game meat? Even you probably before you met Julius and heard about Peza food would not have known where to go. So one of the key things is there's the conservation side, but where's the market linkage and business side? It has to make, you're all entrepreneurs. It has to make business sense to be in the business of conservation and bio trade. And that's probably what I wanted to share about this. There's of course a stronger, and I hope, and Gus will probably share this in his presentation at around 10.45 today. So for the virtual, please do stay around for that. But there is also, uh, a financial, and I think Ma Madame Rosalind was going there, financial benefits for um, following some of these guidelines, especially for ethical sourcing and um, sustainability, especially if you're going to the export market. I'll give you an example for my ladies in this room. When you see a facial a cosmetic pro product, it says ethically sourced, natural products, and the price is in dollars, you'll still feel like, okay, but it's, it's, this is the value of it versus Vaseline, which it's not a natural, you know, it's petroleum. So there's a, there's a value margin that can be added to ethically sourced. You can also have access to international markets, but there's a, there's a process to that and a cost to it, of course. And I always say, I, I wouldn't be the first to say that you get into this business for accessing export markets. Yes, they exist. There's an opportunity, uh, but that's not the only way to, way to go. Any other comments on this topic before we move to the next one? Please, madam, introduce yourself. Your Thank you. Uh, I'm Anne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to concur with what Angelica and Julius said. Um, until three years ago, when I started my cassava. Um, project. I was on the board of the community-based um, management resources forum. Yeah. So what he was saying, I was like, oh my God, it, it really does happen because that is what the members of the forum actually want to promote. You know, like um, what Angelica said about um, when you go, they'll tell you that, you know, you need to do this through a, a community group. Because you see that makes them feel a sense of belonging, you know, the people living in GMAs and so on, that they're part of this, um, you know, process. And so um, I'm just very happy that it is actually happening. Yeah, I mean, I sat on the board, but I obviously didn't go around, you know, everywhere. But um, it's, it's good to hear that it actually is happening. So, um, yeah. I'm just going to introduce a few more terms. Thank you for that contribution and also your expertise from the board. So a few more terms, and I may be because I work in the tourism space. So GMA, game management areas around the national parks and the communities that live around there do have to form these community resource, commu community resource boards, community-based, yeah, community-based natural resources for management boards. 
sorry, Zambia, we have, we have these terms, okay? So they have to form those. Um, managed under, depending DNPW or the forest department, depending on their location. Um, but, but these exist. And what's the next thing I want to say? For your sourcing, for a lot of, uh, many of you at, when we did the survey, but even in the groups, when I speak to you, talk about sourcing. If the communities are not organized as groups, for source, imagine how much more difficult your, your own sourcing will be because it's now get to the chief, the headman, household by household, which I know some businesses do to get your bear, babo, your masuko, whatever input. But imagine if it's an organized group formed with a treasurer, sourcing person, you can call them and I'll say, yes, I'll have 50 kgs of, of so, so and so for you. Uh, one of the people, I don't see him here, maybe because he's busy, but hopefully in other engagements you meet him. Uh, Mr. Fraser Handondo, he's uh, director of Forest Africa and they do baobab drinks. He, uh, he has a target to procure a hundred tons of baobab for this season. He cannot go house to house. He needs the groups, right? So business support organizations, other capacity building people on the ground help organize those groups, but he's the market linkage, right? So we, in the supply chain, we all need each other. We can be one, 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 right? And I think that's the idea of, of this. Um, and that allows me to go straight into my next point. Please, again, in the chat, feel free to put your comments around this in the chat. I will share the comments or resources that you give uh, in the post-workshop email. So now I'll share what Prospero's, as a business support organization, what's our approach to this? Uh, hold on. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Wait, uh, when do I change to the screen now? How did I do that? No. I know, I okay. All right. I have a, a small disclaimer before I share this presentation, an apology, uh, be, if I get, if I sound, I, I've been working in the development space for oh, about a decade. I switch into this language automatically. It's like a second language I speak. So I'll try not to use a lot of jargon, but this is our, yeah, as I explained, but this is our idea to supporting this sector. So how do we grow? We've identified challenges, but identify the little th the things that you're doing in your own way. I think having impact one by one, but how do we increase the size of the pie so everybody's slice grows, right? So we have an idea called the consortium approach. And I wanted to share that with you. Um, so some background, which we already have seen by the, even the number of people in the virtual and the number of people in the physical that we have a number of growing actors who are getting value from natural products in Zambia. And we're addressing, we're addressing a market need. If you have sales, you're addressing a market need. You've proven your point, there's a market need, right? Um, but the sourcing of inputs is disorganized, production capacity and quality is not consistent. And uh, this impedes the development of the entire sector. So whereas, for example, other sectors may have standards, as it's just whatever you produce. Uh, so apart from the sourcing standards, there's limited sector specific information, li limited research and development. I know Madam Angelica had ex expressed a desire, a vision, a grand vision of having a research institute for our cosmetics inputs gen or natural inputs. Access to markets, where do I sell my, my things? And every business, for no difference, there's access to finance. Every single business, right? But I'm sure if you try to go into, we know the issues, um, a formal financial institution and say, I want 
to access finance? What's your business? So I'm going to the village, I'm getting my suit, and then I'm bringing it to Lusaka to say, whoa, <laughs> risk. No, we don't want to hear that. And then there's no sector specific support. I know some of you have, you know, we have, again, as support entities, there are programs. There is, I know Madam Shais has been in Market Connect. You can name the different Zata, what other ones? Peter must know a million of them but they're not sector specific for our sector. Yes, there's entrepreneurship support, but is there entrepreneurship support for the bio trade sector, right? Okay, so now those are challenges. So the consortium approach that we, we thought is to connect all the actors along the value chain. So all the steps that it takes from you having your inputs to, you, to it being in the customer's hand to connect all those actors, right? Think of all the different places you go to as you're doing your business, from the packaging, the logistics person, whether you have to take, get a fight or sanitary, even regulators, whichever office you have to set in, step into, connecting all those actors, right? Uh, and in integrating, of course, the communities, the primary sources in a way that enables them to access capacity building and financial and other business development services as a whole. So if the packaging people are strengthened, you should, that should not be a challenge for you anymore. If the logistics people are strengthened, that should not be a challenge for you anymore. The communities are strengthened, so it has a knock-on effect, but it's an effect for everybody's business, not one business. Okay. This also provides us a way to create, co-create industry standards, develop industry advocacy, and marketing campaigns, and lobby for regulatory reforms. Because they'll say, I think somebody had said this before, where are your numbers? Who are... If you, if you go as one, okay, we are just one. I know that one lady who does this, but you say, no, actually, there are 10 of us. Right? And I believe the market is big. This approach in general requires that there's collaboration and less competition, which is a new concept for us entrepreneurs, but I'm just saying <laughs> more collaboration. Because when we're then going to say, we need a share of the green financing, we need our re regulatory things to change. You cannot, for example, if something, one regulatory, uh, what do you call them? It's, it, it just doesn't fit for Devil's Claw, for example. Devil's Claw is sourced in Western province, Namibia. It's good for uh, numerous health benefits, but in Zambia, it's very restricted. You cannot harvest that. But right across the border in Namibia, trade is going on like hot and fast. And what's happening is then the people are, of course, coming across the border to get Devil's Claw and one, derive the benefits across the border. That doesn't make sense. So that's the idea behind the consortium approach. So the idea behind, but the objective is to establish a competitive, com competitive, well-integrated subsector of natural ingredients, producers and processors that, processors that participate in local, regional, and international markets. When I say competitive, I mean as a mark, Zambia as a market source. Zambia as compared to Zimbabwe, South Africa, other markets that have natural products. So we want to be a competitive source for natural products and uh, yeah, national products and businesses in general. We'd like to see the development of a cohesive or the sector grow together as opposed to this disjointed growth and have economic opportunities maximized for all stakeholders. Sorry, again, that's that NGO jargon, but that's, the big picture. That's the, when we say impact, that's what we mean. So how does that look, right? This is the last, I promise this, uh, this is, no, it's not gonna get more complicated than this. So you'll see, if I say, what's the framework of how to develop? We have the actors at, at, the, at the top, the primary input harvesters. So the communities where you get these products, right? You have, then you can call the next step. Some of them, they get the products and they put them in sacks and they do nothing more. Some of them, they're the same people who crack the bail bags and, and put the, the powder in sacks. It depends, it, right? So primary harvester, input harvesters, then the producer groups, aggregation services. So we bring together the, in fact, in its own little way, I would say Soweto is an aggregator service, right? Soweto market, imagine that. It brings everything together. You go and source from there. Maybe disorganized, but that's, it's, it's doing its best, right? Then you've got the processors, that's where you are. And there's wholesale and retail. Some of you, you are the wholesale and retailer. Some of you, you, are, you sell to other people. It, you can have more than one activity there. Then we have business support 
services, which can be provided by Prospero or other people in the marketplace. Uh, they help with sustainable sourcing practices, training, financial literacy. We have things like corporate governance. How do you put these community groups together? Do they know how to be to form themselves, take orders, and have systems so that they can meet your needs? Thing aggregation services is again also storaging, storage, packaging, equipment, any sort of shared service that all the businesses need, right? And then at the end, R&D, market information, certification, export readiness, etc. So those come and support the entire sector. So our approach around this is definitely leaning on the Convention of Biodiversity and Access and Benefit Sharing, the Community-Based Natural Resource Management Boards, CBNRM. It has to be, to be sustainable, there has to be a market, it has to be market driven, right? You're all in your, you're all selling things. You're not NGOs, right? You're not giving it away, right? So there has to be a market need and we have to see how we can fit it. And then consortium building and joint advocacy. So it has to be a unified as opposed to one by one approach. So that's our idea around this. And then it's framed by strategic partnerships and a business enabling environment. So it has to be, you have to, for all businesses, not just yours in Zambia, it needs to be an ease of operations. But if there's specific licenses or needs to your business, it should not take you four days to get it or whatever it is. So I'm actually quite happy to hear Julius when he said that the license was free for the legal gaming. So that's business enabling. Or to apply is free. What's, what is it? The cost comes in where? So uh, when you, 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 you do the face up, when you apply, you write a letter to the director, it's free. And then they will send someone from the department to come and assess you until you've been approved. It's, all that process is free. And then when we've been approved, the next stage is what uh, they, they call it a permit. So the permit is, is given per month. So uh, then you pay for the months which you want to, for example, you say, okay, I have a uh, 10 kg of gill meat. And then they ask you, okay, uh, how many months do you think it will take you to sell this 10 kg? So if you want, you can say, oh, just one month and then just pay for one month. So it's fair in the sense that uh, if you don't have game meat, you don't pay. So you only pay when you have game meat. But to be on the safer side, you can pay for longer, like a longer, longer permit. Uh, and then the other thing is that, so when I have uh, Impala and Warthog, and then I pay, I say, I'll sell this in six months and then let's say in two weeks it's sold if i go to my supplier they they give me gill meat i don't have to go back to i don't have to go to the department to get another permit they you can do the same one. yes because I, it's still yes it's still active because if it's six months and i'm still within the six months it's still fine Yeah, yeah, so it's still fine. So you can still buy as many uh, as you want for as long as the, the, that permit is still active for that time. So when it's about to run out, then we, once you get an, uh, another, uh, we'll get more stock. And then you go back to say, I want to extend, give me more months. If you want, you can even just pay at a go. Say, okay, I just want to do the whole year. Yeah. Thanks, Julius, for sharing that uh, on that process. And how it sort of fits in our idea of lobbying for regulatory changes if or a business enabling environment. So this is, I'll just leave this, I'll just leave this here for a moment. I'll go back to the chat soon. Um, are they, I have sort of rushed through this. And I, again, I apologize for the, for it being so full of jargon. Go back a second. But maybe I'll pause at this point to see if there are any questions. This is very, this is on paper. You know how they say it looks like point A to point B is straight, but the line is. <laughs> Go ahead. 
uh, on the what's this business support services and actors so when i look at retail processors that in that category like where there's research and development and like that's like they are business support services but uh, i'm thinking for example as a retailer or someone who's doing processing i may need storage as well as the as 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 a service because if i'm processing uh, an, uh, an, an assumption we could make is that i'm buying like in bulk and then so i need somewhere where i can put that uh stock that i'm getting for example if i get maybe uh, 10 bags of a baobab and i'm a processor so where do i keep it so that also becomes a need for me so I don't know whether I should have it as my own or I should outsource it, but either way, I'll still need it. That's a good point. Thank you for that. I'm trying to think of, it's sort of think about uh, if, we, if we compare it to other value chains, let's say maize, right? Maize, there's, you don't have to have your own maize silo storage. In fact, well, maize maybe is not the best, but think about how we have even, uh, government resource that 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 store maize just because i'm a maize farmer i may have something for my, my land but the grain that's going to market can have silos like fra has a storage facility so that's a thought process i think that matters in volumes as well any other comments on the consortium approach before i go to the next slide um can you hear me yes please go ahead hi um on the marketing side of it. I also feel strongly that with this, these kind of products, most of them have some health benefit, whether it's from skin or digestion, um, a whole well-being. But a lot needs to be perhaps done in terms of educative marketing, you know, like saying to the, um, the retail space, you know, why you actually need these products, because they are so much more beneficial than other alternatives out there. Thanks, Moira. That was Moira speaking. And it's, it's actually, if I draw it, especially in our space, or maybe I can draw another example. Uh, marketing for a particular product or just health products in general helps raise awareness from the consumer's point of view that these things exist. Think about uh, well, Moringa, if, if 10 years back, how was the how come that we are it's more accessible in teas in other products than it was let's say 10 years ago it had to start with some sort of consortium approach on the continent i think one of the strongest ones for a natural indigenous occurring product and gus may share more of this so i don't want to steal his thunder is uh the share share association share producers association so share is a cosmetic i know the for those who don't know all the ladies <laughs> might know is a, a share butter comes from a share nut, I believe, and the Jellica, yes. and it's very good for the skin. But there's an actual association that helped create the awareness for share butter at a global level, so that now in almost every product you buy, it says share butter, share butter, and we don't have to ask, is this good for me? What does it do for my skin? We all accept this product. And also, not only that, we accept that if you see share butter on the ingredients and 100% pure, I will pay a premium for it. But that had to come from somewhere. I'll, sh I, I'll share the links to the Sierra Bud Association. They're quite impressive, I think, at a, for a global standard. Exactly. Is there anything like that out there for, for ginger and turmeric? I haven't I come- the awareness is growing. Oh, I haven't come across ginger and turmeric specifically. Uh, there's an oil producers one, um, which the if, if I think you had mentioned you wanted to go into oil. There's there is a regional oil body. Yeah. And it's one of the things that in terms of linkages to regional bodies where Prospero is sort of working on. But I'll, it's part of the charting the way forward. I'll share that. And I can also share the links with you. Um, many of Thank these organizations, you. well, fortunately, unfortunately, the regional ones are out of South Africa. I'll rush by this really quickly. This is just how it fits in uh, 
in our work as Prospero. So this work falls under a landscape livelihoods sector. If we group it in clusters, that might be an easier way to produce because I've seen that pharmaceutical, I mentioned Devil's Claw, and there's also Namfumu Trusts, my colleagues who are not here, they do different powders for BP, some of the powders and teas and such don't even have, they don't even have local names. I think Julius explained the Masamba tea that he had issues for. There's cosmetics, there's food, and then for us, I uh, had and mentioned, there's also crafts and decor, but I actually, we separate the, the homeware stuff from the other natural products. So I would probably put it in, I suggest clusters, for example, of the consortium approach. There's some things where you all come together, there's some things where they're clusters. So again, Prospero's role, again, uh, sorry to harp on my organization, but this is just an approach. Uh, so we could provide, so why would we get in here? Why would we get involved in this space? Of course, yes, we'd like to see more jobs, more rural jobs, especially if you think about the or rural jobs or uh, income generating communities. If I tell you that a 40 kg bag of tamarind at source, so what's paid to the person in the village is 200 kwacha. And if, imagine mm. if, they can, if they can do, one household can do four or five bags. Can you imagine what that means at a rural community level, right? So the income generation opportunities are quite significant. Um, so we hope to provide steering and guidance for the consortium building process with the members. Facilitation, so promoting collaboration, spurring innovation, gathering and sharing of market insights. So you'd all have access to the market insights to prove your business case. So if you need to, I'm applying for grant, you know how many this, we could share, you know, how many store, retail stores are there? Or where do I find Baobab in Zambia? Which, where is it? We can say, oh, it's along the uh, Luangwa Valley, Valley, Valley. This is how much we think is out there because we've done the research. And also linkages, linkages, ease sector actors participation in regional and global trade initiatives. So this is exactly what um, Moria was alluding to. It's like, are there any associations for ginger and uh, turmeric? Well, we can find out. We can make the have the linkages. And as a business support entity, it's actually we find it easier when we say we've got fifty or so businesses in this space, or we've got so many that would be interested in this. Then it it, it uh, provides an easier entry point. Uh, so some of the potential partnerships are, of course, we're going to be hearing from the African Baobab Alliance later in today's meeting, actually in a few minutes at 10.45, is the Biotrade Initiative. FAO is a big player in this, another development actor in this space. They've got very much, they've got a lot of interest in forestry initiatives. In fact, they are running a program with community forest groups in Southern province, which I was lucky enough to visit last week. We Forest, of course, is another development actor. There's Union for Ethical Biotrade. They do sourcing standards at a global level. Uh, Fair Wild, and I think I forgot to include, well, there's many others. There's EcoCert, which is one of the ones that does organic certification. I know a few businesses in Zambia already have EcoCert certification, maybe one or two in the group. Um, the virtual group may have that. Uh, so there's a lot of linkages that, uh, or potential partnerships that can be um, leveraged as a consortium. So instead of a one by one approach, right? So last thing, potential activities, I said for 2020, but really potential activities in general, what you, if, it, if there's consortium, it's building consensus around forming a consortium uh, mapping of natural inputs and seasonal calendar. We're actually going to do that today. More Im information gathering for the sector, setting priorities and implementing action plans. So that's Prospero's approach to supporting the sector. But our approach cannot work without the sector actors. It can be a nice PowerPoint, <laughs> but nothing happens. So that's uh, sort of where I'll end today. Are there any nice comments from the chat that I made. So can you just show that last screen again, please? Sorry. Have I been, have my host, my sharing has been disabled again. Just a moment, sorry. I can share, by the way, I'll share all these slides in the post uh, workshop. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Welcome, Stephen. I'm just going to read your comment. Stephen Bula said, my product is still a prototype. Do you support product development commercialization? It really depends uh, at, at which stage that you are. That may be part of the way forward points I'll add in the end. Uh, who's Yvonne? So we're right at uh, tea break time here in the physical, but it'll also give a chance for, thank you, Barry. Uh, he says, great presentation. We'll also give you a chance for the virtual to take a break. You're not missing anything. We'll come back at 10.45 uh, because we have a presentation by Gus Le Breton, who's the president of the Baobab Alliance. And he'll be sharing on new opportunities in Africa for biotrade and lessons from the Baobab sector. Okay, so we'll take, we'll be back here. Please be back, ready to engage at 10.45. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everyone in the virtual. We'll be starting in the next one minute or so, just having the people come back, the physical. And I know Gus is already with us. So thanks, Gus. We'll be starting just in the next minute. Very cool. Can you hear me clearly? Loud and clear. Very good. Hi, Gus. I think we can go ahead. We um, yes, we can. We can go ahead, Gus. So I'll hand over to you at this point. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, I can't see you, but I know you're out there. <laughs> um, I'm sitting in an office here in Harare, and um, oh. Now I can see you, hey. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just um, thank to Prospera for inviting me to, to give this presentation. It is basically a presentation that I recently gave, a little bit adapted at the African Wildlife Economy Institute in Stellenbosch. So if any of you were there, um, you may recognize some of the slides. <laughs> um, but I'm talking about biotrade in Africa, new opportunities, and I'm particularly using um, examples from the Baobab sector because that's a sector where we've, I think, achieved the most. Um, okay, so uh, just in terms of who I am, those of you that don't know me, um, I am the chairman of the African Baobab Alliance. I also have my own businesses involved in processing baobab and another company called Kaza Natural Oils processing a wide range of indigenous plant products. I founded and set up the trade association Fight to Trade Africa in early 2000. I also produce a lot of videos about African plants um, under the name of the African Plant Hunter. You can find me on YouTube. Uh, my personal mission, just to, to, to give you um, some context, is to develop the economic botany of Africa um, to enable it to play a role in biodiversity conservation, sustainable land management, and economic empowerment. So I'm going to start by just um, putting into context the goals of the African Baobab Alliance. Um, and Kumbi was mentioning the, the Global Share Alliance. We're very much modeled on that. Um, but just to give you guys an idea at a, at a continent level of what the potential scale of uh, this particular sector is. So our goals are that um, by 2030 or so, there are a million rural African women benefiting from the sale of baobab fruit. 10 million hectares of baobab woodland are uh, being conserved and managed. 300 million tons of carbon are being sequestered every year in actively managed baobab woodland. And the industry is worth over a billion dollars a year to Africa. So that's, that's where we're going. Um, so, so those of you that you know, think that this sector is small and insignificant, I'm just trying to point out that it's not small and it's not insignificant. So we're using the term biotrade. You probably discussed this. I'm sorry, I haven't been with you all morning. So maybe um, you already know this, um, but uh, sorry, I have to admit people as well because I'm the host. So when people come in, I'm admitting them. Um, so the biotrade term is one that's recognized in international uh, agreements. It's mentioned in the CBD, it's mentioned in other um, uh, areas as well, other sort of legal areas. So that's why it's a, it's a good term to use. 
And it basically means commercial use of goods and services from biodiversity. Um, it also has a strong implication of social and environmental sustainability. Um, although that's not imperative. I mean, it is possible to have bio trade that's unsustainable, but obviously that, that's not the objective. Um, and uh, in this presentation, I'm really talking about plant products. So let's look at plants, wild harvested plants in the rural economy. Of course, um, they've been used in the rural economy for um, as long as humans have existed, we've used wild plants for fuel, for shelter, food, medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the notion of biotrade doesn't really, isn't really new. Um, and certainly in terms of their contribution to the African economy, um, we don't tend to value them, but if you took them away and then you had to buy all those goods and services, imagine all the people in Africa that live in houses that are built out of poles and, and mud. And if, you, if they had to replace that and they had to go and buy bricks, it would be very expensive um, and medicine and food and all the rest of it. Uh, and of course, bio trade has been commercially used. I mean, there has been commercial bio trade in Africa for a very long time. You probably all familiar with this picture, um, the three wise men. Um, and they were bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh are both bi-trade products. Both come from Africa. Uh, this is more than 2,000 years old, this image. Um, so, but commercial bi-trade has been going on in Africa for a very long time. So why are we only now starting to talk about it? Why is it uh, not been a kind of um, issue in the past and now it is? Uh, I think it's because um, the, it hasn't in historically been viewed as a, um, an opportunity in the formal e economy. Um, it's been uh, much more in uh, the informal economy, but now there are a lot of um, opportunities arising globally that are creating opportunities in the formal sector. Um, and that is, that is being reflected in new initiatives um, in Africa, uh, bioeconomy, biodiversity economy, uh, biotrade sector. These are all terms that you're starting to see. Um, that, that on the left there, that's South Africa's national bioeconomy strategy. Um, Zimbabwe is developing one. Um, Namibia is developing one. Um, and at the same time, from the market point of view, uh, there is a recognition that Africa has huge potential um, to deliver new biotrade products. Um, and the way that it's seen in the industry, the, the, I'm gonna use a phrase that the industry uses, which is natural ingredients. So, you know, if you're producing baba powder, uh, it's probably gonna go into a finished product and it's essentially an ingredient. So um, a lot of the, what, what I'm talking about is biotrade is also reflected in industry um, by the term uh, natural ingredient. Um, so, you know, this is a, a, a newspaper article about super health ingredients from Africa. Um, these, this is a company from the States um, on the bottom uh, that's uh, specifically focusing on skincare using natural ingredients from Africa. On the top, that's a company from the UK called Aduna um, that is specifically marketing African uh, natural ingredients and foods, uh, baobab, uh, hibiscus, moringa, well, moringa is not really African. This is a South African uh, government program supported by um, CBI, which is a Dutch development agency um, on natural ingredients. And the reason that Africa is um, so popular and trendy, um, okay, well, first of all, obviously all human beings originated in Africa. Um, therefore, the history of plant use uh, in Africa must go back longer than anywhere else in the world. Um, and yet we have a very small share of the global market for natural ingredients. And it's not because we don't have them in Africa. Of course, we have them. Um, we are as every bit as biodiverse as every other continent. It's just because in Africa, we've never really recognized it as a sector and we haven't invested in it. So that is a... It's a sad thing that we haven't done it, but it's also a great opportunity for us going forward because uh, for relatively little investment, you could achieve a great deal. 
um, and probably more, there's more to be achieved in Africa than there is in uh, any other continent. So there would be great benefits to us uh, in Africa and to you guys in Zambia from developing the natural ingredients sector or the biotrade sector. Um, firstly, you're plugging into this huge new market trend, which is for natural and healthy. Um, also, of course, it's creating strong competitive advantages for producers from Zambia. So, um, for example, if you've got, uh, let's say, you have got farmers that are currently planting and growing uh, soybeans, and they're trying to compete with soybean growers in the U.S. and in Brazil, um, you're never going to win. It is impossible that you could grow soya in Zambia uh, more cheaply than in Brazil or the U.S. But there's no baobab in uh, Brazil or the U.S. So if you are producing baobab, you have a strong competitive advantage because you have it and they don't. So for me, um, investing in indigenous African plants makes a lot more sense because it, it kind of levels the playing field um, or actually gives us an advantage. Another beautiful thing about um, investing in this sector is that it benefits really small scale producers and it's particularly in those drier areas where you know conventional arable agriculture is just not actually not that productive um, then uh, commercializing the indigenous plants does create um, significant opportunities it's also of course something that supports biodiversity rather than destroys biodiversity so the biggest loss of biodiversity in africa is the conversion of native biodiversity to arable agriculture and um, that has all sorts of problems. And uh, what we're talking about here, the biotrade sector is completely compatible with and actually supportive of uh, native biodiversity. Another thing is um, in terms of human wildlife conflict, I'm sure you guys have this issue in many parts of Zambia where you've got elephants um, spilling over from protected areas into uh, community areas. And of course, the first thing the elephants do is they go chasing after people's crops and especially in those dry areas where those crops don't grow that well and it's really hard work and you're a small scale farmer and you've just grown some mealies and they're about a kind of half a meter high and then an elephant comes and chomps them. Um, if you were harvesting baobab fruit, that wouldn't be an issue because there's no competition between you and elephants over baobab fruit. Uh, another thing is that it is particularly favorable to, towards women's empowerment because um, biotrade products are traditionally in most parts of Africa harvested by women and they are the ones that control both the resource and the, the um, uh, income that is derived from harvesting and selling that resource. And another benefit is, of course, um, in terms of climate change. Uh, so these indigenous plants are plants that have evolved over thousands of years to be in exactly this place at exactly this time. And they are perfect for this landscape in this climate in this time, as opposed to a crop which was brought in 100 years ago uh, from another part of the world completely and isn't that suited to our climate. And guess what, when the rain fails, uh, as it does every couple of years in this part of the world, um, that crop dies. So it's a much more climate proof production system. And finally, um, just to use a bit of a buzzword at the moment. Um, so a biotrade or natural ingredient sector is inherently regenerative rather than extractive. Um, I'm not going to go into that in detail, um, but I'm sure you know what I mean. Uh, and oh, yes, as a as a bonus, it also has strong links to the um, tourism sector. That photograph there is from Morocco. And if you've ever been to Morocco as a tourist, I guarantee 100% you will have been to visit a women's argan oil producing cooperative. Argan oil is a indigenous plant um, in Morocco and it is harvested and commercialized by thousands of rural women across the country. And tourists, when they come to Morocco, they go and visit these women's cooperatives and it's a huge part of the tourism product. And there are massive opportunities for us in Africa from this. Um, it also 
promotes a much healthier eating. One of the big problems that we've got in Africa at the moment is that as we shift away from a traditional diet to a Western diet, people are actually getting less and less healthy because that Western diet uh, is not honestly that healthy. It's, it's very confined to a few products. Um, and a more diversified diet. We, we all know, everyone in Africa knows that our grandparents were much, much, much healthier than we are. Uh, they didn't talk about diabetes 100 years ago because they, nobody had diabetes. And the only reason people have diabetes now is because we eat too much of the same food, uh, not enough diversity. So there's a lot of compelling reasons why we should be investing in a biotrade sector. I hope I have um, summarized them. Um, so then the question is, why, why, if it's so obvious, why aren't we doing it? Well, I think the first point is simply that um, from a policy point of view, uh, we just haven't seen this. We just don't recognize um, the opportunities. And mostly because, you know, we've had a sort of colonial era, um, very um, simplistic approach towards rural economic development based on a kind of industrialized agricultural model, uh, mostly with a very limited range of cash crops, almost all of which are originate outside of Africa. And in fact, we've had colonial era policies that actually ignored and sometimes even outlawed the use of traditional crops and plant products. So for example, I don't know what the story is in Zambia, but in Zimbabwe, we still have a law um, it's called the, that has never been repealed. It's called the Suppression of Witchcraft Act. And the Suppression of Witchcraft Act makes it basically a crime to um, prescribe a traditional medicine based on a herbal remedy. Um, of course, it's not enforced, but I mean, the fact is that, you know, during colonial times, uh, it was viewed as witchcraft. And, and uh, so therefore the policies completely ignored it. So that's the first part. The second one is, is, of course, market, and it is about market, and that is a very big issue. So um, when we developed in our countries uh, this industrial agricultural model, uh, we put in place a lot of infrastructure to support that. So here in Zimbabwe, we have a, a government-supported grain marketing board, and if you grow maize, it's guaranteed that the Grain Marketing Board will buy your maize at a particular price. Um, and it's very simple, the same with cotton, the same with tobacco. Um, it's all you know, very clear. There is a uh, clear um, market opportunity and there's no question, but if you are producing a, uh, an indigenous plant product, it is much harder to know how, who's going to buy it, where, where are you going to sell it? Um, and there's been no uh, support for that. Um, so it is, uh, as a farmer, it is a much more um, obvious economic decision to plant maize than to harvest baobab, because I know with maize, at least I can sell it. The good news is that these, both of these can be changed, and I'm going to... Um, show you an example of where that's already happened. So <laughs> this is actually a photograph of an empty supermarket shelf in Zimbabwe from 2008, but I'm using it figuratively to illustrate the fact that uh, globally, 10 years ago, there were absolutely no baobab products on the market anywhere in the world. And today there are literally hundreds of them. Um, so this is just a few examples of baobab products. Um, there's... Uh, cereals, there are chocolates, there are cereal bars, um, there's ice cream there, there's bites, um, there are all kinds of beverages, powdered beverages, soft drinks, um, alcoholic beverages, etc. There are many, many, many different um, products that are on the market from Baobab. So that has changed um, and that is a massive um, achievement. Let me just quickly review why Baobab um, was, why am I using Baobab as an example to show what can happen when we put our um, collective energy behind developing a, a natural ingredient? Why am I talking about Baobab? Because 
there are actually other natural ingredients in Africa that have a much bigger footprint. Baobab is still pretty small. Gum Arabic in Sudan is a massive product and Sudan, Somalia, the Horn of Africa, um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people involved in the value chain. And of course, the frankincense and the myrrh that I showed you are, are all related. Um, and they, those have been traded for thousands of years from the Horn of Africa. Shea butter, um, which the Kumbi was talking about, um, is about 10 countries in West Africa. Uh, tens of thousands of tons every year. It's a huge industry. I mentioned argan oil. We all know the rooibos tea industry in South Africa. Um, I think the figures are around 20,000 tons a year of uh, rooibos tea are uh, produced, half of which is sold locally and half of which is uh, exported. But all of those, okay, with the possible exception of rooibos, have grown fairly organically. Um, Baobab is the first one that's really been systematically developed from start. And I've been involved in that journey from, uh, from the very start. So the interesting thing with Baobab is that, as I said, 10 or 15 years ago, there was no Baobab industry. Now there is a Baobab industry. And what I'm saying is that we can do the same thing for hundreds of other potential biotrade ingredients. Mm -hmm. So um, baobab has been traditionally consumed in Africa for a very long time. First recorded consumption in Europe was in the 1500s in Italy. Uh, the first uh, serious steps towards commercialization came from uh, East, Southern and West Africa in the 1990s, but they were all quite um, sporadic. The first imports to Europe in the early 2000s. The real moment of change was when we established a trade association, Fight to Trade Africa, or a sector association, as it is, as you could call it, um, to promote uh, baobab and other ingredients. And, and Zambia was part of that. There were a number of companies and players in Zambia. Some of you may even be in the room, I don't know, um, that were involved in Fight to Trade Africa. Um, and a baobab was chosen because it was felt that this was a you know, quick win was a product that could be got to market quite quickly. Um, one thing that uh, we did then that I would do differently now um, is that we focused very much on the export market um, when we started working with Baobab. And the reason was that locally, there was literally zero interest in buying Baobab. Most rural, most people in Zimbabwe and I'm sure it's the same in Zambia, viewed 20 years ago, uh, viewed baobab and, and all these other kind of natural products or, or biotrade products as something associated with their, their kind of rural ancestry. Like when they were kids, when I was herding cattle, I used to chew suck on a baobab. Um, but it's certainly not something I would want to buy in a supermarket or eat in a restaurant now. Um, you know, that's what I did when I was a kid. I, now I want to eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, that's that's how many people see it. So when we started with Baobab, we figured, well, there's no point trying to change that attitude. Uh, let's rather, we, we think we could probably find people overseas who might be interested in Baobab. Let's develop the export market and then we can go back and develop the local market. Um, now that's a very topsy-turvy approach. Most people would say focus on your local market first. Um, and my, my answer to that is that that was, uh, at the time, that was the context. Uh, I think now it's different. And I think now if I, we were to do it again, we probably could start with the local market because I think local consumers are becoming more um, aware. The big problem that we made for ourselves by focusing on the export market was the fact that Baobab was not even legal for sale in, um, in, in Europe or, or the US or wherever. Um, we started by working on um, the cosmetic oil because it's uh, easier to sell an oil that you're going to put on your skin and there are less regulatory hurdles than a powder that you're going to consume internally. So if I put an oil on my skin to make myself look younger, the worst that can happen is I don't look any younger. Um, but if I eat something and it turns out to be poisonous, I might actually die. So that's why it's obviously harder um, to sell a product to, to, to comply with the regulatory um, conditions for marketing a product as a food product. 
but we could see that the bigger market was always going to be for food. So we just said, okay, let's do it. And we worked on this thing called the EU Novel Foods uh, approval, which was to get Baobab um, approved for sale in Europe and then in the US and then in other markets. It took us about four years to do it. It cost us about a half, more than half a million US dollars. It was expensive, um, but it, it, it made it. And in 2008, um, this was one of many uh, newspaper articles that came out when it was uh, approved and it was a big story. Um, and of course, uh, without that, we would not have, we would not have a baobab industry today. If we had not got it approved from a regulatory point of view, we would not have any baobab industry. But that wasn't enough. Um, so just having it legal didn't mean people were going to buy it. And so we still needed to promote it. We still needed to raise awareness amongst consumers. What is baobab? They never heard of it. They didn't know anything about it. And what we did was we went to trade shows, we had um, PR and marketing campaigns. Um, these are, this is an example of a briefing document that we had with a PR company in the UK that we paid thousands of dollars to market Baobab. Um, and these are some of the things that they were, were doing um, in order to uh, to try to bring it into a high level of consumer consciousness. Fighter Trade um, was the association that initially did all of this work um, and it did a great job, but Fighter Trade was working with many different ingredients. Baobab was just one of them and it wasn't enough. And in 2016, um, we had, so by then I had left um, Fighter Trade and I had formed my own company processing Baobab. Um, and in 2016, we got together a whole bunch of companies from Senegal, from Ghana, um, from South Africa, from Mozambique, from Malawi. We got together and we said, hey, you know, we really need to do more to get Baobab out there. And so we formed our own organization, the African Baobab Alliance, of which I am the chair. That was our original meeting in Germany. Um, and these are the objectives of the uh, alliance. Promoting growth of the industry for the benefit of the Baobab harvesters across Africa um, and in three, basically doing it in three ways, uh, growing the demand for Baobab, improving the competitiveness and sustainability and promoting common quality standards across the industry. Um, so just to go into each one of those in a little more detail for demand, um, what we are doing is we are implementing generic marketing campaigns, so I've already talked about that. So just raising awareness about Baobab, supporting new product development. Um, so a Baobab powder uh, can be used in many different products, but uh, somebody has to show industry um, what those products might be. Another big part of growing demand is commissioning um, scientific research to validate health and efficacy claims. So. This is something that uh, has been done very effectively by the rooibos industry. The rooibos industry also has their own um, sector support organization called the rooibos Tea Council. And they spend about one and a half million US dollars a year commissioning scientific research that proves that rooibos is a healthy product. And that's something that we are also trying to do as an African Baobab Alliance to show with Baobab. Because if you're a consumer in um, Italy, and you've heard of this baobab, but you need a compelling reason to buy it. Um, if it's going to do something positive for your health, that is a compelling reason. So uh, that's a big part of our work is trying to commission the science to justify that. Educating manufacturers about baobab. So, you know, you're, you're an ice cream company. You, you are trying to get ahead of your uh, competitors. Um, you're looking for new ingredients. Um, you know, you've heard about Baobab, but you don't really know anything about it. Um, then the African Baobab Alliance is trying to make sure that you do know uh, enough about it to experiment with it. This is examples of scientific research that have been published about Baobab. Um, and there are uh, many uh, papers in, you know, that have been published in, in Africa, in, in Europe, in the US, in China. Um, and this all helps to build uh, the kind of credentials of Baobab as a superfood. 
In terms of sustainability and competitiveness, we are um, really trying to establish a strong network of Baobab producers, uh, providing direct support to um, uh, communities involved in the supply chain, setting up standards of sustainability so that everyone knows what needs to be done um, and in to, to ensure that the Baobab harvesting is sustainable. Um, also monitoring that, monitoring sustainability. Um, that's another um, important component. Uh, not that there's really anything with Baobab that could be unsustainable, but it's nevertheless important to be able to demonstrate that. We have to show it scientifically and objectively. Um, of course, uh, my argument has always been, and, and uh, the evidence I think substantiates that, that if you create economic value for a um, plant resource, uh, that will give people an incentive to look after it. And, and when uh, indigenous plants disappear is when they are perceived not to have any value. Uh, this is also what I do. Um, uh, my part of, of trying to raise awareness um, is making videos that I go out on YouTube and Facebook and whatever about Baobab, which I think all helps. We're also trying to create common quality standards. So um, if anyone that gets involved in producing Baobab produces a really bad product, and if other people eating that product get sick from it, it's going to reflect badly on everyone that produces Baobab. Um, so it's obviously important if we're going to grow the Baobab sector and the Baobab industry that we're all producing good quality Baobab that doesn't make people sick. Um, and so that's a, a big part of, of our role as a sector association. So um, getting a, a standard, ideally getting that standard adopted by national um, standards associations. Ultimately, we'd like to develop a quality assurance label so that if you see the label on the package, you know that this is a good quality product. And also trying to make sure that um, we've got a, a system for preventing adulteration. So. One of the things that does tend to happen um, with uh, Baobab and many other natural products is that uh, people mix in other cheaper ingredients. It's called cutting, um, just because it's uh, they're just trying to cheat the system. So the lessons from the Baobab sector, I'm not, I think I've said enough about it. I don't want to go on to about it forever, but you know, if you do take a systematic approach, preferably through some sort of sector support organization, you can achieve a lot. Um, so this is, you know, from 2010 up to 2018, just showing the growth in the market value for Baobab um, and all the indicators, the different um, countries, you can see uh, the significant changes as a result of this work. It is very important for to grow whatever your biotrade sector in Zambia. The critical thing that you need to do is to figure out what is going to stop these ingredients or these biotrade products from being uh, adopted, incorporated, bought, used, and then addressing those. Whatever those, those barriers are, um, you need to break them down. If it's a regulatory barrier, if it's a lack of awareness barrier, if it's a poor quality barrier, uh, lack of science, whatever, that's what you need to be addressing. Uh, and of course, we need to have um, as efficient and rational supply chains as possible. Um, that's, I think, down the road a little bit. Uh, another lesson is that, you know, the local markets within Africa present a huge opportunity for the future. We've got a billion people in Africa, or we soon will be, um, and that's a massive market. And we are also doing a lot at the moment at a kind of policy level to create, or to support and stimulate trade uh, within Africa, Comesa, etc. Um, and obviously, uh, the African market has huge potential. Uh, I think the final lesson here is about access and benefit sharing um, and just, you know, there are quite complex regulations internationally around access and benefit sharing and it's easy to perceive them as a barrier to trade and an obstacle to trade, but they can also be used as an opportunity because if you in Zambia have a clear 
regulatory framework for ABS. And it is very possible for a company to get, let's say, an ABS permit, uh, a, a certificate of compliance with the Nagoya Protocol. It gives them a competitive advantage uh, on the international market. So, for example, um, countries that take uh, ABS compliance seriously include many European countries, Japan, for example. Japan, you cannot sell anything that is from a biodiversity product in Japan without being able to demonstrate Nagoya Protocol compliance. So if you are able to offer that, you're going to have a competitive advantage uh, over other countries that are not able to provide that. So my conclusion here um, is that plants have a huge potential role in developing. I've talked to you about the wildlife economy, um, but yeah, gen generally developing uh, the rural economy in Africa. Baobab, we've been at it for 20 years. It's now well known internationally. We've learned a lot from that. Um, and because we have learned from that, we should be able to do it much quicker for other ingredients going forward. Um, and uh, I, th I think, you know, we could replicate the lessons from Baobab in five to 10 years for other ingredients. Now, um, at the same time, it is, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It is a process. It's going to take time. It's always going to take time. And uh, the sooner you get tracking with it, uh, the sooner you will get there. So that is my presentation. Um, I will, I think, stop sharing my screen and then we can all see each other. I hope you all hi, <laughs> hi Gus, I don't know if you heard it from our side, but there's a round of applause for your presentation here in the physical. So thank you for that. I know it's now 1126 and I know Gus had said to me that he's got a hard stop at 1130, is that right? Correct, yes. So I'll take two questions, one from physical, one from one from the virtual before he goes, okay, Carl has, Carl was quick to the button. So Carl, if you can unmute yourself and ask him. Hi, uh, hopefully you can hear me. I can hear you, Carl. Great, uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Gus. Very informative and obviously cognizant of your time. So I just wanted to ask a question regarding the approval process. It was very fascinating to learn about the systematic approach versus kind of the organic and that uh, uh, that layout that you did. So what I was curious about was when you spoke about the approval budgets, I think you mentioned about a half a million dollars or so. Um, how was that financed and what was the structure for that? Uh, just, you know, taking the lesson and trying to apply that to, to other potential products. Great question. We finance that through donor money. Um, I think it would be very hard to finance that through private sector money because the thing is with, with that regulatory approval, once you get it, it applies to everyone. So every Baobab producer in Africa benefited from that. Um, so as a private sector player, I wouldn't spend money like that because then I would be opening a door into which all my competitors could then walk. Um, but I think there's a really strong justification for doing it because for half a million dollars, which is a lot of money, but, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, not very much. We now unlocked an opportunity from which tens of thousands of people are benefiting every year. So I think it's a very justifiable use of donor money, a lot more justifiable than many other uses to which donor money has historically been put. Thank you very much. All right, my question, Peter, here is around sustainability. Um, are there enough baobabs to go around if everybody went into the sector? And is there chances of having plantations or something of that nature? It's a good question. Um, baobabs are obviously not killed uh, by the harvesting of the fruit. Um, so certainly the, the commercializing is not going to um, uh, damage them. Um, that said, they do grow quite slowly, so there is a limited supply. But when you look at anything, you talk to any economist about supply and demand, if there's a limited supply and the demand gets close to reaching that supply, what will happen? That supply will become more valuable. At that point, people who own and are involved in the Baobab supply chain will start to achieve greater value for their product. So, 
um, I think I don't think there's anything bad. There's certainly uh, we are at the moment probably utilizing around 10% of the potential uh, baobab that could be used in Africa. So at the moment, there's huge uh, room for growth. One day when we're using 80, 90 or 100 percent, hopefully the price of baobab will go up so much that we'll all get fabulously wealthy from it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Thanks, Gus. Uh, it's 11.29, and one of my greatest promises is that we would stick to time and, and not go over your time. If it's possible, of course, I'll be share, uh, I'll share your presentation, uh, but I might also share a few direct questions because I know people really uh, wanted to get your insight. Is that okay? If I... 100%. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us virtually, and I hope this is just the beginning of your engagement with the Zambian biotrade sector. I look forward to uh, meeting you guys all in person um, one day, hopefully soon. And yeah, thank you very much. Good. Bye bye. You've gone away. All right, if everybody can just mute. But thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for the, the, everybody's attention in the virtual as well. I will, again, this is the recording and the presentations will be shared after uh, after the workshop. I know we jumped over some sections as we we're rushing to meet time, uh, but I think we'll leave the seasonal uh, calendar inputs. We'll probably do, uh, we'll try using the technology to our advantage. I'll share probably a Google link and we can fit that in. I think it might actually work better because then we can slot in pictures of some of these things like Ngai, which we only know the local names for, but you have to see the picture to say, okay, that's what guy is. Well, that, that's what, uh, what's the other one with the pink fingers? Okay. Yeah, what Muchinga Chinga is. So we might do the seasonal, but what I do want to get to, and I think uh, Gus touched the point is, uh, oh, sorry, were there more questions before I proceed? Okay. <laughs> the, is on, the, on the value chain, where are the gaps, where are the opportunities, and what do we do as a sector to try to get there? We're going to try to do this in a very creative way at the physical and I'll see if we can have the virtual join in. But what, let me just share my screen. Okay, uh, team in the virtual, we're going to end here today. Again, as promised, we'll send all the presentations, the recording and contacts. For all those who sent me messages, I'll include you in the group I've seen. Uh, I'll include you by the end of today, I promise. Thank you all everybody, have a good day.